In this lesson, we're going to take a look at acid-base chemistry and how it applies to organic chemistry. Now, there are several definitions for acids and bases, but most of the time when we're discussing acids and bases, we're discussing the Bronsted-Lowry definition. According to the Bronsted-Lowry definition, an acid is a proton or H plus donor, and a base is a proton or H plus acceptor. So here I have an example of a simple Bronsted-Lowry acid-base reaction. On the left, we have water, which will act as a base, and HCl, which will act as an acid. The products here are just hydronium and chloride. As you can see, water, which acted as the base, accepted a proton to become hydronium, and HCl, which acted as the acid, lost a proton and became chloride. The products of any acid-base reaction are called the conjugate acid and conjugate base. Now there's a few ways we can actually look at this. One way is to simply say that the conjugate acid would be the acid if the reaction were to go backwards. So if you look at this example, you can see that the hydronium would be the acid in the reverse reaction. The hydronium would lose a proton, donating it to the chloride and becoming water. The conjugate base is the base in the reverse reaction. So here you can see that if the reaction were to go backwards, chloride would accept the proton from the hydronium atom and therefore chloride would be the base. So we call that the conjugate base in this reaction. Now the conjugate acid and conjugate base for any species are actually independent of the specific reaction involved. Another way to look at this is to simply say that the conjugate acid is the species formed from the base upon addition of a proton. If you look at the reaction here, when the base accepted a proton, that is when water accepted a proton, it became hydronium, and hydronium is the conjugate acid. It is the species formed from the base once it has accepted a proton. Similarly, the conjugate base can be looked at as the species formed from the acid upon losing a proton. So the acid in this reaction is HCl. Once it loses a proton, it becomes chloride, and that's the conjugate base of HCl. We're going to be using the concepts of conjugate acid and conjugate base throughout our study of organic chemistry. Now, not all acids and bases are created the same. Some acids are stronger than others. Some bases are stronger than others. When it comes to acids, we measure and report the acidity of an acid using an acid dissociation constant, or Ka value. The acid dissociation constant is a measurement of the extent of proton loss at equilibrium. If you look at the expression for Ka, it might remind you of the expression for an equilibrium constant, KEQ. Remember that KEQ is calculated by dividing the concentrations of the products by the concentrations of the reactants. In an acid-base reaction, the products would be the conjugate acid and the conjugate base, and the reactants would be the acid and the base. If the base is water, that means that the numerator for a KEQ expression would be the concentration of hydronium multiplied by the concentration of the conjugate base divided by the concentration of the acid and the concentration of the base. If you think about a strong acid, the concentration of the original acid, HA, is going to be a very small value. And that also means that the concentrations of the conjugate acid and the conjugate base products are going to be very large. And that means that the numerator will be large, the denominator will be very small, and that means that the Ka value will be very, very big. In other words, strong acids will have very large Ka values. pKa is really just a mathematical treatment of Ka. Now taking the negative log of a Ka value does a few things. With Ka's, the higher the value, the stronger the acid. But with pKa's, the lower the value, the stronger the acid. In fact, the strongest acids actually have negative values for pKa. Well, so far we seem to be really fixated on acids. What about bases and base strength? Well, base strength is usually measured as a function of the strength of its conjugate acid. There's a value for this. We call it the pKaH. And the pKaH is simply the pKa of the conjugate acid of the base. If you look at this example, we have HCl strong acid, pKa of negative 7. Well, what's the conjugate base of HCl? Cl minus. So we can measure how basic chloride is by looking at the pKa of its conjugate acid, which is HCl. And that means that the pKaH value for chloride is negative 7, the same value as the pKa for HCl. We can determine which side of an acid-base reaction is favored at equilibrium by looking at the acids and the bases involved. In an acid-base reaction, equilibrium will favor the side with the weaker acid or the weaker base. It doesn't matter which you look at. So here's our familiar reaction again of water with HCl to form hydronium and chloride. 
we can see that on the left, the acid is going to be HCl, and the conjugate acid is hydronium, and that means that's the acid if the reaction were to go in reverse. If we look up the pKa values for those two acids, we could compare them. Remember that with pKa's, the higher the value, the weaker the acid. So that means that negative three is higher than negative seven, hydronium is the weaker acid, so equilibrium favors the right. And we can depict that with sort of a lopsided pair of equilibrium arrows. Now, if you do this by comparing pKa values, then you can actually tell how much one side of the equation is favored versus the other based on the difference in those pKa values. The bigger the difference, the more the reaction is going to favor the side of the weaker acid. If you look at the second example, here we have water reacting with ammonia. Now, in this case, water is actually going to be the acid. Ammonia is going to be the base. So if we compare the pKa values of those acids, water has a pKa of 16, and ammonium has a pKa of about 9.3. And that means that water is the weaker acid between those two, and that means that the left side of the equation will be favored. So why is it that some acids are stronger than others, and some bases are stronger than others? We're about to start looking at our first structure-reactivity relationships. Looking at the structure of something, in this case an acid or a base, and then using that structure to predict certain trends in reactivity, in this case, acid-base reactivity. It turns out that base strength is a factor of the strength of its conjugate acid. Specifically, the weaker or more stable the conjugate acid is, the stronger and less stable the base will be. The same is true for acids. Acid strength is a factor of the strength of its conjugate base. The weaker and more stable the conjugate base, the stronger and therefore less stable the acid will be. Now, if you look at those two statements, it, it's kind of like we're going around in circles. Acid strength is a factor of conjugate base strength, and base strength is a factor of conjugate acid strength. Typically, when looking at structure reactivity relationships for acids and bases, organic chemists really like to focus on the base. A lot of bases, and therefore conjugate bases, are negatively charged. So what organic chemists like to do is look for things in that base that can stabilize that negative charge. And if you stabilize the charge in the base, it makes the base more stable, it makes it weaker, and therefore we can tell that the conjugate acid of that will be stronger. So we're gonna look at four structural features that actually will act to stabilize and therefore weaken a base. And most of this really has to do with charge stabilization, specifically negative charge stabilization, since a lot of bases are negatively charged. The first thing we're gonna look at, which is often the most impactful, is the size of the atom that is either donating or accepting a proton. The larger that atom is, it's going to stabilize charge better, and that leads to a weaker base. So if you think of the common mineral acids, the acids that come from our halogens, so HF, HCl, HBr, and HI, if those acids were to dissociate, then their conjugate bases would be fluoride, chloride, bromide, and iodide. And those four atoms represent the atoms that have either lost or gained a proton, depending on which way you're going in the acid-base reaction. There's a trend there, a really big change in the size of those atoms. Fluorine being in the second row, it's a second shell element. Iodine is in the fifth row, it's a fifth shell element. And that fifth shell is really, really, really far away from the nucleus. In other words, iodine is a really big atom. That large iodide atom can spread out the negative charge much, much better than fluoride can because it's a much smaller atom. In general, the more you spread out charge, the more it stabilizes that charge. That means that in this continuum, if we look at the bases, F minus, Cl minus, Br minus, I minus, I minus being the largest atom that is negative is going to stabilize the charge the best. And that means that I minus is going to be the weakest of these four bases. Fluoride being the smallest of these four atoms is going to be the strongest base because it stabilizes that charge the worst. And then of course, chlorine and bromine are kind of in the middle. Now again, that's looking at the bases, but we know that acidity is a factor of base stability. So if we look and see that iodide is the weakest, most stable base, well that should mean that the conjugate acid of iodide, HI, would therefore be the strongest of the acids. And that's exactly what we see. If you look at the pKa values here, the pKa of HI is negative 10. On the other end, we have fluoride coming in with a pKa of 3.2. That means this is by far the weakest of these acids. So that's the general trend. You can look at how the negative charge is being stabilized by the size of the atom. The bigger the atom, the more stable that negative charge will be. That will make a stable and weak base, and therefore the conjugate acid will be that much stronger. The next structural feature 
is the electronegativity of the atom that is either gaining or losing a proton. And this effect tends to be a little bit less pronounced than the size, though not always. The more electronegative an atom is, the more it likes electron density. In other words, it stabilizes negative charge better. And that means that an atom with higher electronegativity, when losing or gaining a proton, is going to stabilize the negative charge better, leading to a weaker base. Again, look at the examples here. Here we have four elements that are all in the same row. Fluorine, oxygen, nitrogen, and carbon. And that means that those atoms that are gaining or losing a proton are all about the same size. So size is not changing here. What is changing here is the electronegativities of those atoms. We have fluoride, which is the most electronegative of the four atoms, and then working our way to oxygen, which is a little less electronegative, nitrogen, a little less electronegative yet, and then carbon, which is not really very electronegative at all. Electronegative atoms can stabilize negative charge. And since fluorine is the most electronegative atom that has taken on a negative charge, it's gonna stabilize that charge the best. And that means that that base is going to be relatively stable and therefore weak. And that means that the carbanion, ion, the negative carbon on the right, that carbon is not very electronegative. It's not gonna do a very good job of stabilizing that negative charge. It's going to be rather unstable as a base and therefore strong as a base. And again, we can take that information and we can flip it around to look at the acid strengths. If the CH3- is the strongest base, then its conjugate acid must be the weakest conjugate acid. If F- is the weakest base, then its conjugate acid must be the strongest of these. And if you look at the pKa values, that's exactly what we see. In this set, what we see is that HF has the lowest pKa, meaning it's the most acidic, then water coming in at 16, ammonia at 36, and then methane at 50. The next structural feature also deals with electronegativity. But now, for the first time, we're looking at other atoms that are not the atom that is gaining or losing the proton. Nearby electronegative atoms can inductively withdraw electron density and lead to a weaker base. This is just another way that charge can be spread out. So take a look at these two examples. Here on the left, I have a carboxylic acid. This is a very common functional group. If you look, this carboxylic acid actually has two kinds of hydrogens on it, right? It has a hydrogen bonded to oxygen and a hydrogen bonded to carbon. Which of those two hydrogens is the most acidic? Because it's always the most acidic hydrogen that's going to be removed first in an acid-base reaction. Well, from what we've just seen, we know that carbon and oxygen are both the same size. They're both second row elements. So size here is not a factor. But we know that oxygen is more electronegative than carbon. And that means that by removing the H from O and making O minus, that will be more stable than making a C minus. And that means that the hydrogen on the oxygen is more acidic. If we were to treat this with a base, it would be the H on the oxygen that would be removed first. Compare this to a very similar molecule, another carboxylic acid. Here, all I've done is I've replaced one of the hydrogens on that methyl group with a fluorine. And fluorine is more electronegative than hydrogen. If you look at the conjugate bases for these two reactions, the reaction on the right, the one that has that fluorine present, that fluorine can inductively because of its electronegativity, pull electron density away from that negative oxygen. And essentially what that does is it spreads out that charge ever so slightly across the molecule. And remember, when you spread out charge, you stabilize charge. So that means that the conjugate base for this fluorinated acetic acid is going to be more stable and therefore a weaker base than the original acetic acid on the left. And because that is the weaker of the two conjugate bases, it also means that the original acid here is going to be stronger. And you can see that the fluoroacetic acid has a pKa of 2.66, whereas the original acetic acid, the one that has a hydrogen there, has a pKa of 4.76. Now, this inductive effect is greater when the electronegative atom is closer to the atom that is either losing or accepting a proton. If you have an electronegative atom that's 20 atoms down the pipeline from the actual acidic atom, it's really not gonna have much of an influence. But if it's really, really close, it's gonna have a bigger impact. This effect is also greater with greater electronegativity. If instead of using fluorine, I had used chlorine, well, chlorine is not as electronegative as fluorine, and so it's going to do a poorer job of that inductive electron withdrawal. And that means that if you think of chloroacetic acid, the pK of that is gonna be somewhere in between the values of acetic acid and fluoroacetic acid. This effect also is additive. In other words, if we had replaced two or even all three of those hydrogens on the original carboxylic acid with fluorine atoms, then the effect would be even greater. Now the last structural feature I wanna talk about is something that we're just barely gonna to touch on, and that is the effect of resonance. 
We're going to talk more about resonance later on. Regardless, some functional groups have the ability to spread out charge through resonance. And that means that when you have that resonance in place, it can lead to a weaker base, a more stable base. Look at the two examples I have below. The first example, we have an alcohol. This is actually ethanol, the booze molecule. When ethanol loses the hydrogen, again, it does have multiple kinds of hydrogen to lose. Hopefully you can kind of quickly figure out that it's gonna be the hydrogen on the oxygen that is most acidic. So the conjugate base is what's called an alkoxide. It's just a deprotonated form of an alcohol. Now to the right is that same carboxylic acid I had previously. When this loses a proton from the oxygen, it turns out that the negative charge is actually spread out equally over the two oxygens of that functional group, the CO2H carboxylic acid functional group. Now the reasons for that we'll have to get into later. Regardless, what that does is it spreads the charge out over both of those oxygens. And remember, when you spread out charge, you stabilize that charge. Because the negative charge is spread out in the carboxylate, that means that it is a weaker base than the alkoxide. And because the carboxylate is a weaker base, it means that its conjugate acid will be the stronger of the two acids. If you look at the pKa's, that's exactly what we see. The pKa of the carboxylic acid is 4.76, and the pKa of the alcohol is 16, and that's a very large difference in acidities. We're going to wrap up with just a brief look at Lewis acid base chemistry. This is one of the other definitions of acids and bases. According to the Lewis definition, an acid is an electron pair acceptor, and a base is an electron pair donor. If you look at the example I have here, aluminum chloride, which is going to act as the Lewis acid, chloride is going to act as the Lewis base. If you look carefully at the aluminum atom in that aluminum chloride, you can see that it actually has an empty orbital. And that's typical for Lewis acids. Almost always, Lewis acid is going to have an empty orbital. That empty orbital is going to be what accepts the lone pair of electrons. And that's exactly what most Lewis bases are. They're molecules or atoms that have at least one lone pair to donate. When the acid-base reaction occurs, do note that the lone pair that's being donated, it doesn't just get taken away from the Lewis base. It goes from being a lone pair to a shared pair, a bond, a covalent bond between what used to be the base and the acid. If you look at the product here, we have this new covalent bond between a chlorine and an aluminum. That covalent bond was the lone pair that the original base donated in to the Lewis acid. We won't be making too much use of Lewis acid base chemistry when looking at organic chemistry, but in certain subdisciplines of the field, it's actually really, really important, particularly in organometallic chemistry, 